Hey there, welcome to The Breakthrough Creative. I am your host, John McDavid, and this is the place where we talk about the business of art and the art of business. I have a really cool guest today. He is a storyteller, a visual artist, a podcaster who hosts a show called Creative Chats, where he uh, has conversations with creatives about how they do what they do. And today, I'm turning the tables on him a little bit, and I'm going to find out uh, a little bit about him and uh, share that with you as he tells us who he is and how he does what he does. He's a visual artist. He spent uh, a bunch of time in advertising and graphic design and illustration, and then kind of got out of the rat race and had had this step into ministry for a season, and then had this amazing... Uh, kind of swing toward the end of that where he finds himself where he is today and he's going to unpack all of that here coming up. Hey before I get to Mike's interview I just wanted to let you know that we now have a Patreon. You can become a patron of the Breakthrough Creative and help support us and there are some cool benefits on there and I want to give a shout out to uh, my friend Greg, who became my first patron at, over at Patreon. So you rock, buddy. Really appreciate you. And uh, if you take a moment, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, would you please subscribe, uh, leave a review, and a five-star rating? That would be fantastic. If you're watching on YouTube, would you subscribe and hit the little notification button or bell so that you'll know whenever a new a piece of content is aired on my channel. And now we're going to meet Mike Brennan. Yeah, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Um, so the the simplest way I've found to talk about who I am and what it is that I do is I say, uh, you know, I'm Mike Brennan. That's my name. And I am a creator and communicator who tells stories on pages and stages. And the reason why I devised that sentence is <laughs> simply because, like many other creatives, uh, there's a lot that I do, right? There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of areas of um, various projects and, and things. And so to break that down, um, really at the heart of it is I love telling stories. I love having experiences and making connections with people and doing that through the things that I create. And so sometimes it's it's things I create that are on pages, and that's my visual art. Um, that's, you know, sometimes uh, illustration, some of the things you see behind me, like on the wall, that's my art, um, you know, doing pop culture portraits or, um, you know, doing some commissions for certain people. Um, I've used that as my area to explore some personal interests, as well as tying that into some things for my business as well. Uh, then I also have graphic design, which is my main background. That's what I went to school for. It's, I work in the field, um, you know, many different agencies, big and small. I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of my journey there. But um, still a part of what I do today. And as far as how I make a living, uh, that's probably the lion's share of, of what I do. Um, and then I also do some things that are um, a little bit of an offshoot from that. Like I do live event sketching. And so um, unlike maybe what some people have seen where it's called graphic recording, I'm not mapping a message that someone is giving from stage, um, but rather I'm doing more what you would see used like with photography or videography where I'm telling the story of what happened at the event as it's unfolding. Uh, you know, this is the person who's on stage. Here's the branding of the the conference or event. Um, here's some of the things that are happening in the crowd. And so you kind of get these snapshots of illustrations that I'm doing in real time. And then you put them all together and it tells a story of what's happened at the event. Um, so that's kind of on the, the pages side. There's some other things in there as well as um, like uh, I've written and, and um, produced art for my own books. Uh, I have about four books that I've self-published. And so that's kind of on the pages side. On the, on the stages side, um, I have a podcast called Creative Chats, and so I love to speak with fellow creatives and just talk about the journey and the process and just really their story and find out a little bit more about them and what makes them tick and find out the common ground. And then I also love speaking and going to you know different opportunities where I can go and share my story, share my experiences, and some of the things that I've learned on my journey that hopefully are helpful for other creative people as well. And so any opportunity I have to do that, uh, I always welcome that as well. Wow, that's awesome. So that's a lot of stuff. Yes. 
And I'm yes. I'm sure you didn't come out of the, the, the shoot like doing all of that at once, right? No, no. And the thing is, you know, it, uh, there's a couple of things. One, you know, there's there's a friend of mine, Jeff Goins, who, who coined this term, the portfolio life. And that's really what resonated with me because I thought to myself, you know, for a long time I struggled with this whole idea of I'm a creative person and here's, you know, everybody's telling me pick one thing, pick one thing. And it always felt so limiting to me. And I'm like, I understand why someone would say that so you can get some traction, so you get some focus. But there's also all these other parts of me that I feel like are always competing if I'm giving attention to just one thing. And there's a lot of things I want to explore and see where there's overlap and see what opportunities may, may come from certain things. And so um, it's been quite the journey to figure out where those pieces fit. And sometimes there's seasons for things. Um, there was a season in my life where music, you know, playing guitar and, and, and writing some songs and things, that was very much a big part of my life. And then that kind of moved out and went into the background and then something else comes forward. And so for me, it was really trying to understand like these things aren't pieces of me that are fighting, but rather they're all pieces of me that sometimes have more prominence than other, you know, in certain seasons. That's really interesting because I, I'm wondering the, the whole pick one thing that, yeah. that advice do you think that, because I think we're about the same age, do you think that was a product of our era or do you think that that kind of, that thread still runs through uh, the world today with people getting advice, pick one thing? Yeah, I think it still runs through because I still feel like there's, I, I encounter that advice somewhere along the way, either on other podcasts or things I've read. And I, and again, I understand it from the standpoint of focus and getting skilled at something, making sure that you put in enough hours. Um, also, one of the things that happened to me, which was, um, I didn't realize this was a blind spot for me in having a lot of things that I was focusing on. I had some friends come to me and they said to me, and this was separate individuals, you know, they came to me and, and they said to me, listen, we love you, we love what you do, but we don't understand it. We don't know how to recommend you. And so I realized that although I had these different things happening and I was changing the channel on what it was that I was talking about a lot in social media and so forth, I wasn't, I had a very unclear narrative for people. They didn't know how what I did helped them nor how they could recommend me to people that they knew. And so that was a big problem, a big red flag for me to say, you know, on the one hand, yeah, I can't just focus on one thing but on the other hand, I can't be so all over the place that people don't understand context and how what I do helps them. So I think there needs to be some kind of um, understanding and context that you can, and a narrative that you can present that makes sense not only to yourself, but the people around you. And then another friend of mine also said something really interesting and, and I think full of wisdom, which was you, you can't do all these things simultaneous you can do them sequentially but you can't do them simultaneously and so in that regard i think picking one thing i wish i had encountered that advice earlier as opposed to trying to get all these different places running at the same time and it feels like spinning plates where you're you're going from thing to thing trying to go okay oh i haven't talked about this in a while i gotta put something out about that oh no i neglected that i gotta run over there and do that you know um that gets very tiring so i think all of that in the context of the conversation of you know do you pick one thing or is it many i think that there's wisdom to be had in both of those conversations but you just need to figure out how that makes sense for your context you know yeah I, and on the flip side of that, I remember being in a, a college class and it was an illustration class and the, the instructor was an older guy and he, he had said, you know, there were a, a bunch of people who, who used to paint shoes. And, do you, and like in the old days when there were newspapers, uh, yeah. Lord and Taylor would have like an ad page in, in the daily newspaper and there were these illustrators who all they did was paint shoes and, and they got done with their day after painting their shoes and they would go home. Mm -hmm. And then at some point photography came along and Photoshop came along 
and they didn't need them anymore. And I asked him, well, what happened to them? And he said, well, they, they left the industry. Uh, and I, I surmise, so did they leave the industry of shoes and they got into something else? Oh, no, 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 all they did was shoes. And so now they're done. Right. And I, I, that, that like sent a shiver up my spine. <laughs> yeah. And, and for the people who I know were well-meaning, we're suggesting pick one thing and go after it. Um, I, I think that's probably the, the like dark side of that advice as mm -hmm. opposed to the dark side of, well, I'm going to do everything, which means I get nothing done. So, so I want to come back to this in a second, but I want to, I want to kind of, find out the early stuff from you what what came first the the pictures or the storytelling like where did where did the creativity yeah. bubble forth from well it's interesting because i think they were intertwined i wouldn't necessarily have thought about the storytelling as consciously as i do today and really it was when I was a kid, it was Looney Tunes, you know, cartoons, and it was, um, you know, comic books. Uh, it was the things that were accessible to me as a kid that I loved. And I wanted to, you know, I, I make the joke and say, I wanted to be a cartoon when I was a kid, you know? And then when I realized I couldn't be a cartoon, I was like, well, I guess I'll be an artist, you know? <laughs> but I really wanted to enter into the world of these these characters and these situations and, and be a part of that. Cause I was like, this just seems like such a, a fun thing. And I love the voices and I loved all the colors and all that stuff. And so um, for me, it was it was learning how to draw those characters. Uh, I had this old Disney light box. Um, I still remember this vividly. I wish I still had it, uh, but it was it was this yellow light box and it came with these tracing pages where it would have the characters limbs and stuff. And, and uh, I just remember it was like Disney movies like Robin Hood and um, you know all the classic characters as well and then you can just basically put them on the light box and then trace over and make your own scene and make your own characters you know do whatever and um i love that thing and then when i kind of moved a little bit past that i was like what else can i draw on this you know and i took some um comics from the from the papers and that was a little interesting because you would have stuff bleeding through the other side so you'd be have to you have to figure out like wait what what is that is that part of the, the thing i'm drawing or not or you know <laughs> so all that stuff just fed my curiosity, fed my desire to to draw and to um, just make stuff. I made greeting cards for parents and for friends, uh, and I loved giving it to them and seeing their faces light up and be like, wow, you made this for me? And at a young age, that did something in me that said, I can create something that can have an impact on somebody else's life, even if that just means making them smile for a few minutes. And of course, you know, you're not thinking that when you're, you know, six years old or whatever. But looking back, I realized that those are very formative moments for me to realize I can create something and give it to somebody and then make somebody else's day better. How can I do more of that? How can I invest my time, energy and effort in my life towards that end? And so um, I just wanted to do more and more art. You know, that was it. So where did that spirit come from? Like that, that heart, that's, that's, uh, I don't know that I hear that from everybody. I think, you know, I mean, I was a kid who was very shy. Um, I mean, painfully shy. Like when someone would call attention to me in certain things, I would get embarrassed and I would feel the heat rise in me. I knew I was getting red and then people would point it out to me and I'd even get redder and I'd be like, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, so I, I didn't, I wasn't outgoing. I wasn't involved with sports. I, it was just all art and entertainment and stuff, but I really valued relationships. Um, they were always important to me. And obviously earlier on, it was a family, you know, it was a family unit and then trying to find some neighborhood friends and, and some people who I could get around me. Um, I remember in, in junior high and high school, it particularly being a struggle with me feeling like I needed a place where I could belong. And um, it ended up being a local youth group at a church where I found my community and friends and that be they became more like family. And so I think wired in me, I think in how like God has created me has been connection and relationship is really important to me. 
And so if I can take that and marry that with the talent and skills that, that he's given me, um, I feel like then that's the best place for me to live out of, you know, the truest place of who I am, I think. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, so we can either kind of move into ministry conversation here or we can kind of step into where did, where did art and career when did that start to become a clear direction for you? Yeah, I, I think there's one kind of flows out of the other. So, you know, it was for me going to art school was the only choice coming out of high school. Uh, so much so that I, I thought I was spiting my parents or something going like, well, if I'm not going to art school, I'm not going to school at all. I'll show you, you know, like, you know what, I'm going to shipwreck my life and <laughs> somehow that's going to be worse than having the stigma of having a child in art school. Um, but, Don't uh, all us teenagers <laughs> want to shipwreck our life, yeah, like exactly. just to raise a fist and go, look what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it turned out that it was, uh, they were like, okay, if this is really what you want to do, then fine. But at least do something where you can make money. Um, By the you know, way, just, did they understand you? Did they understand the art? Ah, you know, yes and no. Um, my mom particularly always encouraged us to follow our dreams and my dad too, but my dad was a New York City detective. Very different world. Uh, things that were very black and white. And he went on a tour uh, of one of the art schools of one of the ones I ended up going to. And he saw some things that were like student projects. And he's like, you know, it just looks like trash. Like, what is this hanging out in the hallway? Like, I just I, I would have thrown that away. Like, you know, <laughs> he just it was not getting it at all. And, and to to add, you know, to that. He used to teach at the police academy, which was a couple of blocks away from one of the campuses of where the school was. And he would see, you know, with his fellow cops, he would look out and see all these, you know, weirdos of the art school. And he'd be like, you know, who's who's doing drugs and who, you know, who got arrested over there? Or what's going on? And they would joke and, they, and he'd say, well, you know, no, no child of mine is ever going to go to a school like that. You know, well, P.S. years later, that's exactly the school that I ended up going to. So, um there was that kind of comical thing that was going on. But but overall, you know, of course, they they were supportive, um, not always understanding in the actual creative, you know, portion of it. Um, but because of wanting to to support and love, they were like, yeah, we're, we're here for you. Um, so but be, because of that whole conversation, I ended up going towards graphic design as opposed to illustration or fine art or animation or something like that. And so that was okay with me because I was also very much into music and I thought to myself, well, you know, if I can do some album covers or I can do some art that's related somehow, you know, some graphic design that's for magazines, that's entertainment or whatever, I thought that'd be, you know, perfect. So um, fast forward, end up graduating, getting out into the field. And my first job was at a really huge advertising agency uh, on, you know, uh, you know, up in Midtown Manhattan, Fifth Avenue. And man, this thing was a beast of a place to work. And I felt like a cog in the, the wheel. You know, it was just this little, little person who is like, I'm the you know assistant to the art directors. And um, I would get frustrated because all day long I'm sitting there and there's really not much to do. And then like four o'clock, they would drop a whole bunch of stuff on my desk and they'd be like, hey, we have this, this uh, meeting tomorrow morning. We have to show all this stuff. So we got to work through the night. And I was like, what? I'm like, I was sitting here like all day. You know that this was sitting on somebody's desk and then they just went to lunch and whatever happened. And then it got, by the time it got to me, it was late in the day and then we had to work through the night. And so that environment, I just really didn't like. It felt very cold and impersonal. On top of that, there was a lot of like flushing the creative system that happened where there were random firings and it just felt like the Titanic. You know, nobody knew if they were next and just not a, not a great working uh, environment. So from there, I bounced around to a, a couple of other different places. Um, knew that I didn't want to be in a huge corporate place um, because again, me being more personal and, and relationship oriented. Uh, I ended up at a couple of places where I was the art department, um, <laughs> which presented a couple of other challenges of, okay, how do we do this? How do we get scrappy and make things happen? Um, you know, who do I need to know in order to make some things happen also? 
uh, so did some uh, editorial illust uh, I'm sorry, editorial design for a number of years in, in some various magazines, uh, worked in a couple of boutique agencies, you know, basically it was the, the kind of thing where it was every four or five years would roll around, there would be something that would happen that was the impetus for me to go and get another position someplace else, whether it was I hit a ceiling, whether it was um, staff changes, whether it was, um, you know, one time where I was let go because of a staff change and they had some other people they wanted to bring in. So all this feeling like, OK, I'm getting experience and I feel like I'm supposed to be like somehow climbing the ladder or this has got to be leading someplace, but I'm not really sure where that coincided with me feeling a little frustrated the last job that i was out um in this sequence of things i was really happy as far as the the people and and it was close to home so the commute was fine the money was good but i just felt like every two weeks there was a deadline and i wasn't getting to enjoy the work that i had just done and now i have more to do on top of it and this growing divide in me of the you know, design and art stuff and the relationship stuff. And I was involved with my home church doing a lot of volunteer ministry stuff. And that's really where my heart was starting to come alive. And I was like, you know, I can't wait to get home or go and do this thing with these people because I feel like the stuff I'm doing at church is making more of an impact and having more significance than the stuff I'm doing from what I'm getting paid for in my, my job, you know? And so struggled with that for a little bit um long story short ended up leaving uh you know the design position went into full-time ministry um you know that was a whole other thing of like you know i'm an art student uh, i'm not going to seminary i don't know but you know like you sure about this god are you sure you got the right guy um but through a series of relationships and opportunities ended up um going into full-time ministry what i call a slash job which is basically like all the stuff that nobody else wants to do, right? It's like nursery slash college ministry slash worship leading slash 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 slash. And so did all that for a number of years. Uh, it brought me back together with my childhood friend who was a youth pastor. And then we had this evening service that kind of took off like a rocket. It was more like rock and roll church. Um, and so uh, that ended up becoming uh, a, a, another point of division where it was like, okay, are we staying here and growing this year? Or, you know, my, my friend had felt like it was time to go out on our own. And so um, we assessed that and we said, okay, I think we're gonna go what's called planting a church. And so we're like, how do you plant a church? I don't know, we're gonna go figure this out, right? <laughs> we're gonna ask some questions and get some people around us. Uh, there are some organizations out there who can come alongside and guide and, and help with some things. And so that's what we did. We, we launched this church, we planted this church and the thing took off like a rocket and, you know, we're doing five services in, in a Sunday and there's all this stuff that's, you know, there's basically three of us on staff. Um, there's there's all these ministries that we're trying to launch at the same time. There's so much growth. There's so many things happening and there are a lot of things to create. Right. And so I'm creating, you know, not only the branding for the church and the visual identity for what's happening from Sunday to Sunday, um, all that stuff for all the different ministries. I'm also doing kind of, you know, associate pastor uh, work, if you will, you know, I'm doing uh, some counseling, I'm doing, you know, whatever pastoral duties and stuff. And eventually that came to this place where um, I knew that things weren't good. And I knew that I was very busy. And it had been a long time since I had done any art, really. Um, and so one time somebody came to me and they said, Mike, we feel like you're not yourself. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, I think you're depressed. And I was like, I don't have time to be depressed. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I'm so, you know, my calendar's full. I'm, I'm busy. I'm like, I'm spoken I'm like a true minister. Yeah. You know, and I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, well, if I was depressed, I'd be like at home on the couch, like crying or like just in a funk and not able to function. But I didn't realize that like, it was true that I was suffering from depression. Um, I was just high functioning and because of being wired to be a doer you know you just keep yourself busy and you don't take the time to assess like okay what's really going on here like what what's the problem and there were there were several different things that overlapped that caused this depression to get really bad um and one of the things was that 
you know, I had my friends, my faith, my finances, you know, all that stuff all in the same bowl. And when one thing starts to unravel, it all affects everything else. And on top of that, I was also functioning in some roles at this point, five years in, that were not really in like gifting. I was doing some more administrative stuff, uh, less creative stuff. It had been, you know, 10 years since I had really done any art for myself, any personal art or, you know, um, anything that was, was really stuff that I love to do. And it started to wear on me. And eventually things just came crashing down and had to leave that position, leave that church, move, um, try to figure out like what comes next. Uh, I feel chewed up from the ministry machine. I'm broken. And I've been out of the design world for a number of years and feel like some of that stuff has passed me by because technology and some other things uh, not being in it day to day. And um, I'm like, I don't know, really know where this leaves me. Um, and it was a very dark place to be. And so in the middle of that, or I should say towards the end of that, you know, I'm, I'm moving. That's what brought me here to where I am now in New Jersey. My dad had um, been diagnosed with cancer and passed away very quickly. Uh, two weeks into me having another position at a different church where I was just a, a graphic designer on staff. And so no leadership, just a graphic designer, just kind of doing the branding and stuff. And so <clears throat> that was kind of a blessing in disguise for me because it was like God saying, okay, we're going to pull the car on the side of the road here and we're going to get some health. And we're going to get some healing. And um, you don't need to be in a position where you're dealing with those things right now because that's not what's best for you. Um, and so that gave me some space and some time and, you know, some frustration, honestly. But it, it, it made me pause and ask some questions and one of the things I felt rising up in me was you need to come back to your own art mm. your personal art and I was like it's been 10 years how do I do that like I don't can I do that I don't even know so I had started to get some you know books and I took like a local printmaking class just because I'm like it's something I don't know that this is what I want to do but just it, it's getting my hands going again it's getting me around some other artists and um and then somebody turned me on to this idea, this, well, actually first this book, uh, it was called um, The um, Creative License by Danny Gregory. And in this book, he talked about a, a bunch of different things, one of which was, you know, doing this 365 day art making journey, which for me, thinking about doing art every day for an entire year was so intimidating. I'm like, I don't know that I can do that. I haven't done 10 years. I don't know that I can do a week or two every day. Um, and so I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll consider that, but I'm putting a pin in that for now. I kept reading the book, and he addressed a lot of things in me that I realized that I had accepted as, you know, they were lies, but I accepted them as truths for myself, such as, you know, if uh, I couldn't do photorealism as a style in my art, then I wasn't a true artist. I could be a designer, sure, but an artist, an illustrator, mm, you know? And I knew that there were other people who didn't do photorealism, like, intellectually but for whatever reason that was impressed upon me that's the benchmark that's that's success if you can do that and I couldn't do that well and when I tried it was frustrating and so I thought to myself I'm just not skilled or talented enough to do that um and he's was like you know if you want photorealism take photos you know <laughs> like you know use photography to do that if if you're really not if that's a stumbling point for you and that's not something you want to um, a skill you want to acquire uh and and on the other side if your your drawings are kind of wonky and proportions are off and, and things are a little weird that actually might be part of your style and character of your drawing like embrace that don't resist it um and so through a bunch of things like that, it, it brought me back to this place where I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this again. So I blow off the dust from my art supplies that have been sitting around for a while, and I go out to a Starbucks, and I'm like, okay, crack open the sketchbook, and I'm going to draw my Starbucks coffee cup. And so I did it, and I looked at it, and I was embarrassed. I was like, I really hope nobody is looking over my shoulder right now, because if they knew that I went to art school, and they looked at this drawing, it would be the most embarrassing thing ever. <clears throat> But I had a choice right then and there, and I realized, like, okay, this is day one. Day one is horrible. Day one is awkward, and it's embarrassing. But it's day one. And so tomorrow I'm going to show up and do something else. 
And so I learned to celebrate that drawing and I share that drawing a lot now, um, not because of its technical ability whatsoever, but because I like to talk about how sometimes we need that day one experience to embrace being a beginner again and give ourselves grace in things that we feel like we should be a lot further along than where we really are. Give ourselves grace to be in the process and understand that that's exactly what it is. It's a process. And so I started day one and day two, and I was like, okay, I can maybe try to do, you know, two weeks worth of this. We'll see where it's, where it's at. I had to break 365 days into small chunks and then keep attacking it. And that's basically how I got through my whole first year where I did a drawing or painting every single day. And then I said to myself, okay, now what? I don't think I'm done. Let's keep going. So I kept doing that and eventually realized like, hey, there are certain things that are happening in my journey that are speaking to me that are principles that are not just for me, but I believe they're for other people. I believe they're for other creative people, regardless if it's you know, drawing or painting or some other creative expression. There's something about this journey of engaging with that passion and that, that talent and that, that desire within you um, on a consistent basis and growing in that and realizing what's your voice, what's your style, like all these things that we talk about, you know, as creative people sometimes we struggle with. How do you know? How do you know what your, your voice is? How do you know what your style is? Um, I found that it's by showing up and doing the work. And so um, I've continued on that journey and uh, I'm like about nine and a half years in now where every single day I've done a drawing or painting. Uh, and this is outside of anything that might be considered like work related because some people could be like, well, you know, it's really easy for you to say to do that because if you're getting paid to do that as part of your job. But especially in the beginning, this was stuff that was like stealing lunch hours and like, you know, take a sketchbook while I'm waiting in line at a store or whatever. Just finding those moments to redeem to put towards um, making sure that I'm showing up and doing the work. Um, and so that led me back to my art and going, okay, oh, this is really what I love to do. It's not just design, but it's also illustration. Oh, and it's not just illustration, but it's these type of things. It's um, also now me sharing my journey and experiences because I really believe that my ministry years gave me a context of sharing my own life and experiences so that it's helpful for other people. And while I'm not a pastor anymore and I'm not working at a church, I really do believe that me sharing my journey and my process and the things that, that I have gone through and continue to go through, when I can find some redemption in that by sharing it with somebody else and helping somebody else, that's when I feel like, you know what, this is, this is where the value is, you know. Um, so that's kind of where that's led me to today. In, in, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's man, that's... Uh... It's a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. To 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 have gone through, um, and it it just reminds me that we live lots of different lives mm -hmm. throughout the course of our life, and you know it was interesting that your story began post college with you working in a grindhouse, right? As mm -hmm. as a designer, illustrator, art director and and then it was too much and you got out of that and you moved toward ministry and then ministry heavy and then that became a grindhouse for you and I know how painful it is to to leave a church right and Lee it sounds like you left people behind and yeah and and it's very ministry is strange uh and and it's wonderful and i mean there's just a, a whole a whole bunch of stuff in there that it it, it it just is um but but after that how how did how did real i'm i'm assuming you realized that that you kind of were in the same situation in both places even though it was a little bit different how did you reconcile that or, or move through it. And then how did you manage your critic? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. cause I imagine your critic wasn't just in your art. Your critic is, is, is on you about everything. Right. Yeah. 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 I think that, you know, for the first question of, of, you know, it was really me understanding that 
I was looking for someone to give me a job description and for me to go, oh yeah, that's, that's me. Like that's, I can fulfill that. I can check all those boxes. If you just tell me what to do, I'll show up and do it and I'll do a good job. Um, but that also made me a passenger in my own life for many years because I, I kept looking for this external voice or validation to tell me this is what you should do. This is what it should look like as opposed to taking the time to go, what do I want it to look like? And if it doesn't look like something that is a, you know, art director position at such and such place or a pastoral role or ministry role in such and such a church, if it doesn't check all those boxes, what does that look like then? What can that look like? Is that possible? Like wrestling more with those kind of things, I think earlier on, I thought that I had to fit myself into a certain mold um, and then would get frustrated when that didn't work. And so the older I've gotten, the more I've realized that, you know what, there, there are things even just about being a creative person that don't fit in a lot of contexts. Yeah. And part of your job as a creative person is not just solving other people's problems, but it's also trying to figure out how to solve your own in that regard and saying, okay, I've got these pieces. What do I do with them? Yeah. And maybe not every piece has this tie to your career but does it have a place in your life you know um what's important to you what's important to you not just in making a living but also in your mental health and in you following your passions and being the kind of person you want to be um to help you show up in all the areas of your life you know so wrestling through that stuff um in terms of the critic the critic is sneaky because the critic will come at times when you are most susceptible to it and it's not always the voice of somebody from your past you know where it's like some people it's you know they know it's the parents or that authority figure from when they were a kid that was like you know you can't do this or you're, you're terrible or whatever um you know for me most of the time it's it's self-doubt it's oh this isn't going to work you know it's it's negative spiraling thinking that feeds into the whole portion of like depression and being susceptible to that stuff um and mental health and just being aware of like oh you know what i need to fight that more i need to be more aware of my own thoughts and realize that not every thought that i think is true nor does every thought that i think have a place um, sometimes you have to go, you know what? No, I'm not thinking that anymore. But you have to, to work on yourself enough to be self-aware. Um, realize that you're having these thoughts and that you're not just a victim to your own thinking, um, but that you have an active role in that. And so that takes work and it takes being around some other people. It takes sometimes professional help, um, yeah. you know, and not being embarrassed by that. And you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I try to talk about this stuff when I can and when I'm asked about it is because I think too often we're shamed by this stuff because it looks like everybody else has it all together. It looks like everybody else's life has been so much better. Nobody else has struggled with this stuff. Nobody else is having these issues of these voices that are telling them, you know, this isn't going to happen. They can't do this or they're, they've tried a million times. They should just give up on their dream and, and pack it in. Um, I don't care who you are, how old you are, what you've been through. There, there are just times when I think everybody struggles with those things um, yeah. to certain degrees, you know. And the more that we normalize that, the more that we talk about that, I think the more helpful it is for each other. Because uh, I can share, again, some things that I've been through and find some value, some redemption in that and know that, okay, this was pretty bad that I had to suffer through this. But if I can help somebody else along then I feel like, you know, okay, it has value. And somebody else hearing that, I've been on that receiving end where I've listened to podcasts where I've read books or, or talked to, to people and heard their stories and gone, oh, that's normal? That's part of the journey? That's part of the process? I'm not the only one? Yeah. Because I felt like the only one. Yeah. You've just given me a tremendous gift in helping me feel seen and heard. Thank you. You know? 
Yeah, that's really good stuff. And it, it brings us full circle back to the power of story and, and sharing your journey with people who are, 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 I mean, it's beneficial to people to hear our stories who either have gone through what we've, we've gone or something similar to what we've gone through and it's an encouragement or to people who don't realize they're even going through something and then they'll say wait just like you said a minute ago you're like wait i'm not the only one i mean i think feeling alone in this world is is something that everyone has experienced but then to realize we're not alone that's man that's uh that's freeing that just opens everything up or opens up some new avenues that probably we hadn't thought of before. Yeah. Let me ask you this, uh, but are you codependent? Do you have a codependent nature? I don't know that I've ever necessarily had that officially yeah. <laughs> described of me. I think there's tendencies for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and more as of late, as I've talked to some other people too, who have, you know, some, some different relationships have changed. Um, there's been definitely some identification of that. Yeah. Yeah. Years ago I was in therapy and we, we were going through the first three months, first time I'd seen the therapist and, and we really hadn't gotten anywhere I felt. And, and I asked the therapist toward the end of the session, Hey, I, I, I need to know what, what's going on here. And she said, well, time's up. And, and I said, wait a second, I, I'm not leaving until you tell me where I'm crazy. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and she said, well, you're, you, you have low self-esteem and you're codependent. And I was like, you are full of it. Like, that's not true. And I, and I walked out of there and I had a really quiet week thinking through all of that. And, you know, codependency uh, ha had been described to me by the therapist actually as, as a, a, a codependent when, when they die, somebody else's life flashes before their eyes. And, and you get so caught up in other people's feelings and, and how to serve them. And when you're a high functioning, well, anything, but we'll say when you're a high functioning creative or when you have a heart to serve other people and there's always more people to serve, right? In ministry yeah. or in art. There's something also in there. I think of when you're, you're operating in that it's very easy to live somebody else's dream. Yeah and help somebody else build their dream without ever asking yourself, what's my dream, you know? And that's a very dangerous place to be too, because then you can spend, you can spend years, you know, constructing and building and doing whatever. And it's, you know, that whole thing of like, I put the ladder against the wrong building. I've got to the top of the ladder now I'm going like, oh wait, this is the wrong building, you know? Um, that's not just like a, a cute little, you know, analogy, but it's, it's, it's a hard truth sometimes, you know? Yeah. So this brings you to today. So tell me, how did you get to today where, where you're, you're speaking, you've got the podcast, you're creating your art and, and how does that actually translate into you and your business and how you make a living? Yeah. So it has been so that that position that I, where I was the graphic designer at the church, um, you know, I was thinking to myself, OK, there's there's overlap here. I'm doing this, but I'm knowing that there's more that I want to do. And so in my mind, I'm thinking I need to get to a way where I can kind of go part time and kind of step out on my own and do some stuff and, you know, have that runway, you know, like you start constructing all these plans. And of course, none of that happens the way that you expected or wanted to. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, uh, the church I was at, there was a huge building program and there was budget cuts and there were two designers on staff. And there was a younger guy who was, you know, less of a salary than mine, I'm sure. Right. And uh, I, you know, got the ax and I was like, once again, I'm leaving ministry. And but then I was kind of feeling like, OK, this feels like a push out of the nest and it's learn how to fly. Um, so many of the things that, that I have, the, the times when I've grown the most have been the times when I'm like, I don't really know what to do, but I know enough that I need to figure it out. And so I learn best when I'm in the midst of something and going, okay, I need to figure this out. Who do I need to talk to? Who do I need to surround myself with? What do I need to experience 
to learn or what skills do I need to acquire? Or what, it, what does this look like for me to be able to move into this? And so that was really me moving into my own, you know, um, my own company, my own, you know, design agency, if you will, or it's not really agency, but, you know, just me being freelancer and, and um, you know, doing the putting the pieces together in a way that made sense for me and going, OK, these are the, the places where I want to 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 show up. Um, now, how can we figure out how to monetize that? Um, or if not, then what place does that have in my life, if any? Um, so there's a lot of assessing that went on there. Um, and there's honestly a lot of things in the entrepreneurial world that I was not aware of that I had to figure out. And again, surround myself with some people and go, oh, I just spent the past six months to a year doing this and that's not what I need to be doing. That's not what I need to be focusing on. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the whole, you know, pivot. Um, I have pivoted a lot because of figuring things out along the way, the hard way, as I've just been going. Because it wasn't like I was going to school for this. It wasn't like I had somebody who was, you know, a mentor who was taking me by the hand and saying, here's what you do. Here's how, you know. So a tremendous amount of trial and error. And, um, you know, there's a still there's still today even a certain portion of where things have to pivot and shift. And, you know, COVID enters in. Nobody's expecting that. And how does that affect things? And, you know, um, I think realizing like you have to have a high degree of comfortability with always being engaged, always figuring out how you can advance things. It's not a set it and forget it in this kind yeah. of life. Um, very different than a staff position where you just kind of show up, you clock in and you clock out. You work hard when you're there, but after that, you're your own time. Um, when you're doing things this way, it's you're always with it because it's you. It's everything's overlapping and you have to figure out ways to set up some boundaries and some things. So I was going to anyway, ask you, how do you actually manage that? Given uh, your, poorly your a lot of times. Uh, <laughs> poorly. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's 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 difficult. Um, I've I've had to identify certain things like even, for instance, where I am, where like where I'm living. Okay, this room is my office and this is where I need to go when I'm doing some work. And in the living room, that's where I'm chilling out or, you know, reading or whatever. And so if I try and take my laptop or take some work into that space, I'm violating something for myself. And it doesn't seem like a big deal in the moment, but it actually is because I'm telling myself it's okay for me to be working wherever, whenever, in whatever space. Um, and I need, I, I don't have anybody telling me, here are the boundaries. It's just me. And so if I don't set them up for myself, um, nobody's going to do that for me. And so you figure that out by bumping into and by messing up a lot, I think, um, and then figuring out going, okay, that didn't work. Oh, we need to adjust that. Uh, we need to work on that and keep keep mindful of that. So that's always a work in progress, honestly. Um, and then as far as like what things look like today, I mean, still the lion's share of, of my income comes from design work. It's working with a variety of different clients. Um, most of the time I'm looking for that personal connection, that relationship uh, for work to come out of that because that's what I value. And I love when I can come alongside people who I believe in what they're doing and they have a specific need that I can help with. And, you know, everybody wins, I think, then. And sometimes that's logos and branding. Uh, a lot of personal brands and small businesses uh, I've worked with. Um, sometimes it's social media graphics and, you know, setting up some Canva templates and some other things in that regard. Um, the work can vary. Uh, depending, most of my design work was centered on print stuff, um, not necessarily doing websites and, and that stuff. Um, don't really enjoy, uh, I, I always say that, that feels a little more like science than art sometimes with, you know, dealing with coding and all that other, I'm like, that's, I'm the guy who likes to draw something or paint something, <laughs> like that's art, that, that other stuff is, is code, that's, that's too much, like, you know, no, uh, no thank you. Um, so anyway, there's that stuff. And then, like I said, on the illustration side, sometimes that bleeds over into design um, where I'm getting to custom illustrate for a logo or somebody needs me to do some illustrations for a book project or, um, 
you know, a, a lead magnet for marketing purposes, you know, things of that nature. And then sometimes it's private commissions uh, or me setting up some of my personal projects and then creating like doing a series uh, where I did, you know, um, a whole bunch of yoga poses. Uh, some people that, that were online and, and on Instagram that I had seen, they inspired some work. And so what I did was I'm like, OK, I did basically a year's worth in my my daily creative habit, years worth of doing yoga art. I'm like, that's a lot. What do I do with this now? And I said, OK, well, yeah, I put it online. You know, I'm sharing it on social media. Yes, I can, you know, create blog posts and other content that's continue to be shareable. I'm like, what else can I do with this? And I thought, well, what if I assemble this into a book? And so I created this book, The Art of Yoga, and it's profiling different people because I said, well, OK, it'd be nice to have a book of my art that people can look at. And if they're into yoga and that kind of thing, they can flip through and be like, wow, that's really I can appreciate that from an artistic standpoint. But again, that thing in me that goes, I want to connect with people. I said, what if I contact some of the people that inspired this art and said, hey, would you like to be a part of this book? Can I profile you in this book and give you a chance to like even just say, you know, what does yoga mean to you or share your your website or your Instagram handle or whatever it is that you want to share? Put that right next to the art that I do of you. And so this way, it's a way of honoring you and inviting you into the process. And so I had 16 ladies who were like, yes, absolutely. And they were, you know, some were stay at home moms and others were like CEOs of companies. And this book kind of brought everybody together and allowed me, you know, to be able to put this together and encourage them. And then also encourage people who, you know, end up checking out the book. So uh, learning how to self publish through Amazon, again, another one of those like, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to figure it out. And so I've, you know, I have, you know, like multiple books now that are self-published on Amazon, um, because once you learn that process, you can just repeat it for other things. And right. so it's how can I create some some products or even now like digital products, like, say, Canva templates? I create a lot of those and sell those for different um, niches. So if it's, you know, the church world or if it's, um, you know, um, podcasters or, or have, you know, what have you, I'm creating different assets in Canva that people can buy that at, at a lower price and be like, hey, this helps them. They can now go and do whatever they need to do. And so figuring out, again, that goes back to the whole thing of it's not just one thing. It's not just I do design and I do print design and I do logos and branding and that's it. Um, because I'm interested in more things than that. And like you said before, you know, if something happens where all of a sudden a market tanks or something has, uh, you know, something shifts, you don't want to feel like you've put all your eggs in one basket and then all of a sudden you're trying to play catch up instead of going, oh, OK, this is not functioning well right now. Well, let me rely on these other things that I've been trying to set up and that are running now either in the background or that I have different seasons of the year that I move into. Um, so. I think that's that's the beauty of trying to set up the kind of portfolio life, if you will, is having multiple th irons in the fire so that at any given moment, one of those things may take the foreground, depending, but you're not stuck with just one option, you know? And then I like that you have these uh, uh, repeat, I don't know if this is the right way to put it, you have, you have these assets that you can sell again and again and yes. again. Yeah. Uh, how has that been? Like, what, what, how, what would you say percentage of your business, your income that actually is versus yeah, your design work? It's not huge, um, but that's also been a learning curve, too. And, you know, I'd say maybe 10, 15 percent right now. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff like if it's more product oriented, like, say, even some of the, the illustration and designs, uploading it to, you know, certain shops and things that are print on demand. You know, the holidays, you'll get a spike in some things and then some other times of the year, it's there's nothing going on. But specifically, like, say, with Canva templates or design templates, um, I realized that I could do the work once and then try to get it in front of the right people or I could continually try to go, OK, I need a new client. I need new needs. I need, you know, uh, this never ending thing. And I'm like, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's and both. And um for me to be able to continue to pour gas on the the templates and the resources um that's going to serve a very specific market because not everybody wants to do their own stuff 
you know, not everybody has the capacity to do that or, or staffing or the interest, right? Some people are like, no, just, I have the money, just do it for me. Um, you're the expert, I wanna hire you. Other people, they're like, no, I want the resources. Um, or I don't have the budget or whatever. So I think looking at where the needs are, looking at the, the problems you can solve um, and not getting stuck with in your head or in your, your methodology too much of like, this is what I do and it's all about me and, and isn't this great? And I've created this thing and I throw it out there and don't you wanna buy it? And Because then it's not, there's again a disconnect of how does that help somebody? How does it solve somebody's problem? Um, it may be great. It may be really, you know, you may be really talented, but if it's, if it's not doing anything to, to, to bridge that gap, then it's not going to move and people aren't going to be interested to buy it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good stuff. So uh, where did the uh, speaking gigs fit into this? Is this something that you added before the podcast or during or... I, it came a little bit before the podcast. Um, you know, that's a part of my business that I'm still trying to build up. Um, and that comes really more from the ministry context because of I used to preach every so often. And so having public speaking for a number of years and, and enjoying coming up with a message and sharing it with somebody. Um, and now in the context of like helping other creative people and sharing my own experiences and, and my own story that hopefully again, it encourages and inspires people, um, looking for more opportunities to do that. And so, you know, it, it made sense for me when someone said, you should have a podcast. And I thought at first, like, mm, I don't know, it seems like a lot of work. I don't know, you know, and I know myself where I, if I commit to doing something, I'm going to do it. I mean, my daily creative habit of you know coming up on 10 years has shown me that much that i i have the ability to sustain but do i want to that was the question <laughs> yeah. i had to you know yeah. to wrestle with and so i thought about it in terms of not just like hey i'm gonna have a whole bunch of solo episodes where i'm you know pontificating about whatever you know um that didn't feel tremendously great to me I do have episodes where I do that because there are maybe some things I want to share or, you know, scheduling things happen sometimes with guests or whatever. But by and large, it's mostly me talking with my guests and, and exploring their stories, exploring their creative process. And and I liken it to opportunities where I may have had with somebody to sit down over coffee and just be like, hey, tell me about like your journey. Tell me about your life and, and your creativity. Like, what does that look like so far? You know, and I'm just genuinely, I'm genuinely curious about their life and their process and, and creativity. And I figured if that's true of me, it's probably true of other people. And why not record it so that other people have benefit and it's not just me. Um, and so that's been a really uh, awesome tool for me to be able to have those conversations, to get them out there and help other people. And then also try to help build a community of people who are, all trying to figure this stuff out, you know? Um, and I may just be 10 paces ahead of somebody else, but those 10 paces may be exactly what that person needs where they are right now. So um, I think having community and building community is really big too. And you're doing that online as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, a, a private Facebook group. It's called Daily Creative Habit. So if you go to dailycreativehabit.com, it'll bring you right to the request page for that. And um you know, it's, it's creative people who are not just visual artists, but we have writers and we have musicians, we have, um, you know, entrepreneurs even in there, because I say the way that I talk about it, even on my podcast, I say it's artist makers and content creators, right? It's this, this idea of if you're somebody who's creating something, you have an idea and you're pursuing that and you're making that a reality. There's something about that process that can be transferable no matter what medium you happen to, to be using or what your your skill set is in, as far as talent and, and those kind of things as well. Um, because you we can all learn from each other. I can learn from the person who is a musician, even though my, my main art may be visual art, um, something about how they think, how they process. And so... I said, you know, if we can get a bunch of people together talking about their process, sharing their experiences, sharing their questions and their struggles and, and all with a desire for, you know what, I want to show up more consistently in my creativity. 
um, because that's that's been my story is when I started showing up more consistently for my own art, that's when stuff really started to happen because I, I had to do a lot of bad art to be able to get to the good art. And if I thought to myself, well, I don't have a whole afternoon or a whole day that I can dedicate to my to my art. Therefore, I'm just going to wait until that happens. It doesn't happen, you know, especially the older you get. It just doesn't happen. So it's how can I devise things so that I'm scheduling my time, especially in the beginning, to make sure I'm showing up for my art, not waiting for the muse, not waiting for the perfect timing, not suffering from what I call masterpiece mentality, where it's like we think we have to sit down and create the masterpiece in one sitting and, and you know, come out of our, our studios or our places and hold it up high and the, you know, the heavens open and the light shines down. And I have created the masterpiece, my life's work, here it is. You know, like that doesn't happen. Or if it happens, it's like the, the rarity, right? Most often it's us showing up in small ways. It's us doing something going, mm, I don't know that I'm really happy about that, but I learned this. And what I learned from that, I'm gonna apply to what I'm doing tomorrow. And so if you don't show up consistently, the gap of when you learn something and when you start to apply it is greater and the chance of you actually forgetting it or not applying it is greater. Um, and so that's why I, I really encourage people to show up daily. Uh, even if it's only five, 10 minutes, that's better than something. And there's a cumulative effect that happens when you show up daily for your creativity. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So is there anything I haven't asked you that I should ask you? Um, I think we covered most of the stuff. I mean, uh, you know, like I said, I mean, I do a lot of stuff, so it's, <laughs> yeah, there's always something to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could talk to you for another 10 hours. Um, so I usually close the show with advice you have for artists who want to make a living from their craft or their art i'll mm -hmm. say art twice there and then uh you can go ahead and and give me all the places people can find and contact you again and then i include that in the description of the episode um yeah this has been really good mike i really i appreciate you you're sharing everything is there anything that we talked about that you wouldn't want in here? No. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So let me go ahead. I'm going to clap so I know where it is. So Mike, as, as we come to a close and I could talk to you forever, it's great to hear your story. It's a very encouraging story. Um, I, I guess I want to ask you what, parting words of advice or wisdom would you have for artists who want to make a living from their art? Yeah, I would say a, a few things. Number one, show up. Because if you don't show up and show up consistently, it's not going to happen. Nobody's coming to find you. Nobody's going to discover you. Don't wait for permission. Don't look for somebody else to give you permission. Give yourself the permission to show up today, right where you are. Even if you feel like where you want to go and where you are, there's such a gap that you're not even sure how to do that, how to navigate that successfully. Like just do the right next step right now, wherever you are. Concentrate on that. Break it down as small as you need to for you to be able to get some traction because that's really what I think needs to happen is you get traction, you start to experience some wins, you get some encouragement and that fuels you to go more and faster and to figure things out and make those mistakes and pivot. Without that, without showing up and being consistent, you're, you're not gonna experience that and you're not gonna be able to get to the place where you are making money and starting to, to make a living off of your art uh, and creativity. The other thing I would also say is Learn what you need to hold loosely and what you need to make sure you hold tightly because there are certain things, certain methodologies, certain technologies that you may have to hold more loosely to um, and understand that as things change around you and as um, circumstances happen that you have no control over, you need to be 
able to adapt quickly and not get swept under by circumstances that happen. Um, and so that's as you're ramping up and getting involved in, in you know, making a living off of your creativity, but it's also once you're there, there is no set it and forget it. There's always a, how do I need to adjust this? How do I need to tweak this? Oh, what is this? What's the next iteration of this need to look like? How do I need to respond to the, the needs that may have changed around me? Um, it's, it's constantly scanning the horizon and figuring out what does next look like? And in and amongst there, also learning that there are places where you need to rest and make sure that you take care of yourself. Because if you're always scanning the horizon, if you're always doing, if you're always iterating, you're not feeding yourself, you're going to burn out and things are not going to last and they're not, and, and they're not going to go the long haul and you want to be in it for the long haul. So show up, be engaged, do the work, you know, it's possible. That's awesome. Thanks again. So where can people reach you if they're looking for you? Yeah, if they're looking for me, uh, as long as it's 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 a good looking for me, I don't owe anybody money or <laughs> um, they can find me on Instagram. I'm at Mike Bone. Uh, I post there still my daily art uh, every day, you know. And uh, you can find me on my 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 main website, which is mikebrennan.me. M E. From there, you can use that as a hub to get to my podcast, which is Creative Chats. Uh, you can see some of my illustration work. You can see uh, my website for the live event sketching. And then also there's a link out to my graphic design site and then also the speaking. Uh, I have some some video clips on there as well uh, if anybody's interested in checking that out. But those are the main places. Fantastic. Mike, you rock, dude. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, John. Hey, Mike. Thanks so much for sharing your journey. Uh, you rock. I've really enjoyed getting to know you, uh, not just through this episode, but we've had a couple of conversations by Zoom leading up to my interview of you. Thanks for letting me turn the tables on you. I really, really enjoy seeing all the art that you post on Instagram. I, I also uh, have become a part of Mike's Facebook group. Uh, he's just got a really encouraging, nurturing Facebook group for creatives, uh, a place where they can go to be safe and to share, and uh, as I said before, to be encouraged. Uh, I think, Mike, as much as I love your work, and I, I, I think that it's just spectacular, I love the colors, I love your style, I love your approach, I think I, think I really appreciate who you are even more than your work. I guess it's uh, uh, a, a part of you, so I get to enjoy you through your work, but I really appreciate the person that you are. I, I, I appreciate the work that you've done on yourself, and um, how you are pursuing, uh, you're really pursuing life. You know, you're, you're pursuing the, the very best stuff. You're not going after the rat race. Uh, you're working. You understand that you need to work. You understand that you need to earn and, and you want to do that creatively. But you've made this commitment now to uh, supporting others uh, you do it through your podcast where you have others share their creative journeys and, you know, you're doing it uh, when you go out to, to share with people your story and uh, even in some of the classes that I see you teaching now online and there's, there's just so much good stuff there. So I think that Mike is a, a really good person to follow and uh, listen to his show, Creative Chats. I just listened to one from this past week uh, where he was interviewing a, a sculptor, a bronze artist. And it was just like just sitting down, you know, to have a, a coffee or a beer with a good friend, listening to these two guys chat back and forth and this guy share his story. Such amazing stuff. Um, so if you want to find Mike, find him at Mike Bone on Instagram. Uh, you can find his podcast on Apple Podcasts. And it is, of course, called Creative Chats. And then if you would like to find all of his links uh, to his website, contact him and whatnot, you can go to mikebrennan.me and all of those links are going to be down below. So that's it for this week. On behalf of the Breakthrough Creative, I am your host, John McDavitt. And of course, we love talking about the business of art and the art of business here. And I hope that you're going to take that next step, whatever it is that you have in mind for yourself to get to wherever it is you want to go in your business and your creative career. 
you're going to have that thing that you're going after this week that is going to be uh, one less leaf to rake in the backyard of your creative career, okay? You're clearing it out. You're going to take that next step. So get busy about the business of doing whatever it is that's going to get you closer to where you want to go, okay? And I will talk to you next time. Cheers.